So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Reagan. I'm Mare. We're MetaNet Software, and we're going to talk to you today about N++ and what that is, and some of the things that we find really exciting and, and cool about it. Um, so this is going to be a really informal talk. We're just going to show some video and tell you a bit about the game and about the development process. And you can come try it at our booth if you haven't already. Get a better sense of what it feels like. So uh, just to quickly, a show of hands, who has played N or N plus before? All, all right. right. So. Lots of you. Nice. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, the main thing about this game, about N plus plus, is that this is the game we've been trying to make for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, we made N, we made N+, and each time we made it, we learned a lot, but we always felt there were always things missing, things we failed to execute on, things that we didn't have the budget or the time or really the skill mm -hmm. to uh, achieve. And the goal with N++ was to make one last final version that's like the definitive, the best, like this is what we always wanted it to be. Um, and uh, I think that we've actually succeeded. I mean, we're still putting the finishing touches on it, but we're really happy with how it turned out. Yeah, the core of the game hasn't really changed since 2004, but we've added a lot of new levels and new enemies, and basically it's just about refining it. We're kind of perfecting this concept. And you can see that in the game, too. I mean, it's, it kind of reflects how you play the game, because um, that's what you do as a player also. You play a level, you die, you learn something, and then you try it again, and then you succeed. So. It's an interesting parallel. All right. So uh, my apologies. Sadly, the video is all 30 frames per second, so it doesn't look quite as nice and smooth as the game. But rest assured that the game runs at a very wonderfully smooth 60 frames per second. <coughs> oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, OK, so the game. Uh, so the basic game rules. I guess everyone's familiar with. You run around, you're trying to make it to the exit alive, you collect gold. Um, the most important thing about the game, we feel, is the feel of it. Uh, that's like the central thing, is the feel of controlling the ninja. And uh, the, the inertia-based movement. Our inspiration for that really was Mario. We're huge fans of the early 2D Marios, and we really like that sense of momentum that you get on the horizontal axis in Mario. And within what we were trying to do is figure out how to extend that same feeling of momentum vertically. Uh, because in Mario, it's sort of just left and right. Uh, and anyway, so that's sort of, the, that's like the core of N. And I mean, from that vertical momentum comes all sorts of things, the wall jumping, the sort of acrobatic freedom that you have. Like, a, you have sort of have a quite a wide range of movement. And oh yeah, it's very hard. That, that's part of it too. Um, I mean, in the past, uh, 10 years, and especially since we made N+, we've, or, sorry, since we started making N++, uh, we've been reflecting a lot about what exactly is N, like, compared to, now there are a lot of, like, hard platformers, so what exactly is special about N, what's different about N? Plus plus. Plus plus. Uh, other than the feel, and so we think that part of it is, like, the moon gravity, everything's sort of in a semi-slow-mo, and what that does is it lets you, um, well, okay, wait. Is that? <laughs> All right, it lets you improv. That's the main thing about it. It's not uh, one of those sort of DDR style hard platformers where the level designer sets up this thing and then you have to execute, you have to press all the buttons. In N++, it's about planning and execution. And if you screw up your plan, you can adjust on the fly and kind of, you get into this sort of zen flow state and I don't know. I mean, usually you die anyways, but. Sometimes it, it works out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so it, I don't know. It's, it's tension. It's about tension and the feeling of success. Right. Um, another thing that we think is really important to what makes this game what it is and how it feels is the game's design itself. So as you can see, it's a single screen platformer and it's arcade style. But what the single screen adds to the game is that it's very fair. You can see every single enemy. There aren't any hiding off screen, you know, waiting to kill you before you can even see them. There are no leaps of faith where you can't see the ground you're supposed to jump on. So it's very, very fair. And that means that you as a player get to see the whole level and plan out your route before you start playing and you know, come up with a plan of attack that you think might lead you successfully through the level. Um, 
which doesn't always work. But the two main phases of this game are planning and then executing, which isn't really very common. Like Reagan said, usually games kind of require you to come up with your plan, but the plan's the same for everybody. You just have to be able to press the buttons at the right time or, you know, just get that timing perfect, do it a little bit faster than someone else, and you're good. But in M plus plus, you often have to revise your plan on the fly. And that's what we think is really exciting about this game, that it, it forces you to think on your feet and to really pull off something crazy. And that's what makes it so satisfying when you do it, because you know it's your skill. You did that. You made it happen. Um, we call it a puzzle-ish platformer, because, again, the single screen lets you see everything all at once. And you can kind of, it's got elements of, of puzzle solving. You know when you look at the enemies, what they're going to do, and you can kind of figure out how you're going to get through that complicated slew of, of terrifying challenges. Um, it's also really, really difficult, but again, it's fair. There aren't any cheap deaths, and there aren't any cheap successes either. When you fail, it's because you made a mistake, and when you succeed, it's because you're a skillful, maybe a little lucky, but usually skillful player, which is, I think, the most satisfying thing about this type of game. Um, and finally, it's really minimalist. So everything you see on screen matters. There aren't any, you know, there's no um, scenery, there aren't any props. Everything on screen has a purpose. No little bunnies. No little bunnies, no. That would be too cute, I think. It's, it's all just ninja killing robots in this game. But that helps you focus on the gameplay, because you don't want any distractions in this game. You've got to be able to focus and you know, pull off what you need to pull off. So it was really difficult to choose what to cut and what to keep, but we feel like we've pared it down to exactly what it needs to be. It looks like I quit in that replay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right. So the final thing, just about the game in general, that we want to talk about is the graphics. Uh, so. I mean, N and N plus and now N plus plus have always sort of had a, a minimal, as Mara mentioned, style to them. But for this one, we wanted to really achieve what we've always wanted, which is this very nice, smooth, anti-alias vector rendering, which we weren't able to do in uh, previous versions. So, and the thing that's important about the vector graphics, be beyond just the aesthetics, is the function of them. We really think that the most important part about games should be gameplay and that the graphics, every aspect of the game should support the gameplay. And the reason that smooth anti-aliasing matters in N++ is that it lets you feel the smoothness of movement. With pixels with a sprites like Mario, the least you can move is one pixel. One pixel steps is the smallest that anything can move. But once you have nice anti-aliasing, you enable sub-pixel movement. So you can, you can actually feel and see fractions of a pixel, which can often matter in this game. And so we thought it was really important to get that in for this uh, final version because it's, it's super important to the gameplay. Um, and one thing is that it looks very simple. It's a very uh, stripped down minimal style, but it's remarkably uh, GPU heavy. You can't really tell. Our programmer claims that it's equivalent to four billion times multi-sample anti-aliasing, but I don't think, I think he's crazy, but it, I, I, it, as far as I can tell, it's equivalent to 256 times multi-sample anti-aliasing. Which is still which, a, a whole yeah, that's, lot. That's more than you need probably, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So like when we started making this in early 2012, we actually had to buy a $600 GPU because uh, we were sort of bootstrapping on the PC initially. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> as far as we know, no one has done graphics this way in a game. Also, uh, there are a couple demo scene things that do it this way, but we think we're the first to do it in the game. And finally, the last thing about the graphics is the style, uh, and especially the color. So previous iterations of this series have had a very spartan and functional color scheme. It's just gray on gray. And I mean, we think that's important because again, it puts the gameplay first. It's uh, very neutral and it lets you play for a long time without tiring your eyes or distracting you. Um, but for this one, we really wanted to play around a bit more and try to make more of a dynamic in terms of feeling using color. So I mean, the original colors will still be in there if you like that. I mean, we really like the really functional part. But we sort of had fun experimenting and finding these color schemes that work really well. I mean, the game is still very playable, but they 
they just sort of help the feeling. So like if you're playing a really, really hard level, you might want to pick some nice soothing colors to help you not throw your controller. Whereas if you're playing sort of an easy, fun level, you can try one of the crazier color schemes uh, to make it sort of a bit more exciting. Um, all right, that's about it for the, the overview. OK, so now we'll talk a little bit about the enemies in N++, because there are a lot of them. And they're slightly different from the ones that you find in other platformers. But the main thing about them is that they're really simple and easy to predict. So again, when you're looking at the whole level before you start playing, when you're, when you're making up your plan, you can predict what they're going to do. And you have a sense of that before you go into it. Um, most of them react to the player, which is also another thing you don't find uh, in a lot of platformers. Um, so when you move through the level, they will, I mean, they see you when they come over and kill you, or maybe they shoot at you. Right now, this laser is just rotating statically, so unfortunately, it's not the best footage for what I'm talking about, but I'm sure we'll, we'll see more of them. But generally, they encourage you to move, because that's what we really love about this game, the way that it feels when you move around. So we wanted to encourage that, and we designed the, the enemies to help uh, facilitate that. So for N++, we wanted to add a few new things, but we definitely did not want to add any gimmicky things that felt tacked on, because we hate that stuff. And this is the best and last version of the game, so it would be awful. But we came up with a lot of ideas and basically just tried to explore them. Like, we, we prototyped them and saw what worked and played around with it until we were sure that this was the right thing to add. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of them that we really love. But while we were working on enemies, the things that we kept in mind were we want to have them react to the player. We want them to add something new to the gameplay so there's something exciting for N++, but nothing gimmicky. And we wanted them to have an interesting um, addition to multiplayer, because that was the other thing that we're really working on. So let's talk about a couple of the enemies that are really good. Right. So yeah, we don't have time to go through all of the new enemies, but we'll just hit on a few of our favorites. So toggle mines are the first ones. There are those little circles you can see. And the way that they work is they're safe to touch, and as soon as you step off of them, they turn deadly. And um, this was like one of the first new things we prototyped. And initially, we thought, like, there's nothing new we can do in this game. Like, you know, we don't, anything new is going to be this awkward, gimmicky, stupid thing. But then once we added these, we realized, well, actually, uh, that's not true at all. We're kind <laughs> yeah. of idiots for yeah, thinking well, that. There's a lot we could do. I'm going to wait. It's kind of spoiler, so I'm skipping the rest of that level. Sorry. Uh, so the way that Toggle Mines, uh, I mean, the main function of them is that it's a single screen game. So if you want to make a longer level uh, in N++, you typically have to reuse space. And we do that a lot by sort of, we call it the there and back or out and back, where you, know, you start on the left, you move to the right, and then the last half of the level, you're moving from the right to the left. And uh, reusing space is really fun if you do it right. Because if you just, I mean, if you just do it the bad way, it's boring because you're playing the same level again and again and it, it doesn't really make sense. But if you do it the right way, every time you move through that same space, it's a bit different. The context is different. Maybe you're moving up instead of down, which feels different. Uh, toggle mines really help this. They help, I mean, they literally change the level so that every time you move through it, it's different than the last time. And uh, finally, really the best thing about the toggle mines is in multiplayer. Uh, they enable all kinds of really fun puzzles in co-op where one player has to hold a toggle mine for the other and typically there's like some kind of rocket or something bearing down on them as they hold it and it's very tense. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially for the competitive race mode, nothing is more satisfying than setting off a toggle mine right as one of your opponents lands on it. It's just hilarious every time it happens. Um, yeah, that's about it for toggle mines. Um. So now we're going to talk about the death ball, which uh, or we also call it the murder orb. Or the kill sphere. The kill sphere. We're not really very good at naming things. Um, so the death ball, as its name suggests, is a ball of death. And it basically just kind of follows you around. You can't kill it. It was inspired by the rocket, which is a staple of N and N+, and also a huge part of N++. But um, I guess the thing about the rocket is it's very thrilling, it's fast, um, it gets you moving, but it's really difficult. So we love that thrilling, you know, chase feeling, but we wanted to give novice players a taste of that as well. So we wanted to make something that is just as exciting, but isn't as difficult. So the death ball moves a bit slower, and 
you still, I mean, when it's catching up to you, you still get that feeling of incredible tension and it's very exciting, but you, I mean, you can move around them, you can maneuver around them a little bit more easily. So, um, what else did I want to say about oh, this? I mean, oh. they're a bit easier in that they're slower, but right. they're harder in that, unlike rockets, they never give up. You can't crash them into a wall or anything. They yes, just keep right. on coming. And also, finally, uh, the most fun thing happens when you add multiple death balls, as this will show you, because they bounce off of each other, and mm. it turns into this really chaotic situation that you really have to improv. Like, there's no way of planning, because the way that they bounce is... I mean, let's just watch this <laughs> I don't actually remember if we ended up beating this level in the replay, because it's very, very hard. Uh -oh. um, but yeah, it's like this gives you a, a taste of something for more seasoned players, but uh, well, you died. Yeah. I mean, it's but really it's fun helps. because you can steer them around. So the, w yeah. the way that you move affects where the cloud forms and how it forms and what you can do later. And uh, yeah, it's sort of, I don't know, it's pretty fun. It adds a bit of a puzzly nature to things. Yeah, and in co-op, you can kind of lead a death ball away from your teammate and help them out that way. Uh, but in race, you can sort of draw a cloud of them over to your enemies and, and take them out. All right. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on from this one, but <laughs> we'll never know if, if that ninja made it or not. Okay, and the final new uh, enemy we want to talk about is the evil ninja. And this is like one of our most fun new favorite things that we yeah, added. we totally love this one. Uh, we actually have been sitting on this since 2008, like uh, the week that N Plus came out. We were at GDC and we saw at the Experimental Gameplay Workshop there's a game called Cursor Times 10, which is a little web game and you, you move your cursor around and interact and then you do it again, only your first run through keeps going. So you're kind of interacting with yourself and building up these layers. And we thought like, well, we got to try putting that in a platformer because it's such a fun, anyways. It seemed like it would be fun, and it turns out it was really fun. Uh, like the way that evil ninjas work is they do whatever you did two seconds in the past, and as you can see, they stack. So it's like two, four, six, eight seconds in the past. And it gets really interesting at about 10 seconds because the game forces you to focus on the here and now to control your player. So it's really hard to remember more than about 10 seconds ago what you were doing. And at that point, the ninjas, the evil ninjas are like strangers, and you have no idea what it's. It's very tense. So you can you can sort of approach it. There's, it's like a, a spectrum where at one end there's the puzzly approach, which is you know you're going to have to return through there, so you try to do jumps so that on your way back you, you can go under the jumping evil ninja. And that's like the one end of the spectrum. The other end is you just run and you don't really care what you're doing, and then you just try to dodge and improv your way through the cloud of evil ninjas. And I mean, it, it depends on the level, but pretty much both approaches are fun. They, they, they both work depending on how skilled you are. Wait, mm -hmm. I just want to show this last evil ninja level, I think. All right. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, actually, I think I, I forget who was playing this. But anyways, I believe we beat it in the first try. But this one is really hard. It's hard to explain the weird puzzliness of the evil ninjas just by watching them. But it's just this really strange thing, because you have total control over this enemy. You can dictate exactly where and when it does stuff, and yet it's still impossible to avoid it killing you many times. Which that replay totally does not show. No, it, it, that's You made terrible. it look really easy. Um, anyways, all right, so that's it for new enemies. And now on to the game modes. Uh, so single player is obviously still the focus of the game. Um, and that's good. But uh, something that we dabbled in previous versions is multiplayer. And uh, we tried to do, we spent a lot of time um, during development refining and focusing uh, the design of the multiplayer because we, I don't know, we think it's really, really fun. So uh. so this is co-op. Um, it was one of our favorite things from N+, but when we started making N+, um, we had no idea how to design co-op levels because up until that point, for I guess four entire years, we'd been thinking about this game as a single player experience only. So co-op was brand new to us and we started making some levels and it was interesting to see how it really changes the dynamic of the game to work with someone else. So we really loved it in N+, and we made a lot of levels, and they were great. Fans said it was their favorite thing, too, which is awesome. But as if you get the DLC packs for N+, you can see how far we've, we'd come at that point in developing levels for it. They're much better than the ones that are built into N+, because we would had so much more time to learn what works and what's fun and, and 
play around with ideas more. So for N++, I mean, it's been six years since N+, so we're even better at making co-op levels now, and we have, we've had many, many more kind of puzzly, interesting ideas that make you, as a team, work together and figure out how the game works together. It's my favorite part of showing N++ because I love watching people figure things out together and like talk about who's going to go and get the switch and who's going to go to the exit or who's going to lead away this death ball or who's going to draw a fire so that the person, the other person can get to the exit. It's just really fun to have that dynamic and, and you know, you, you sacrifice each yourself for the other person and it's just it's it's a really really interesting way to play the game and you punch them in the shoulder when they suck and keep dying yes you know <laughs> but their co-op the way it works is there are usually different jobs for each player and you get to decide who plays like who does what job basically based on your strengths and weaknesses as a team um, and yeah you just kind of sometimes you're in different spaces like in this level sometimes you're in the same space as in the previous level, and you, it's all just kind of about talking together and figuring out a plan, and, and yeah, let's co-op. This one's pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> one really fun thing about co-op is that one of the players often functions as a timer for the other player. So in this mm -hmm. case, like, the yellow ninja is sort of the timer for the, the black ninja, where if the yellow ninja goes faster, the black ninja doesn't have to stay alive as long. Too bad. <laughs> I thought they were going to do it that time. Okay, and so uh, the other, um, so that, that was cooperative multiplayer. So the other uh, multiplayer mode in N++ is race, which is competitive. Um, and the idea is that you're trying to make it to the exit first, obviously. Uh, you see at the top, you start each level with a little bonus, and you can collect gold to grow that. And you're trying to hit the exit, which catches, caches out the bonus for score. But my favorite part is, what? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, you you can't go. quite see it in that one. But when you hit that exit, you turn into a rocket, and then you can go kill the other players. It's up to four people, but we only had two when we were recording this. So uh, please come and try it because it's like it's really really fun. Yeah, we're super happy with this one. Um, I mean, there was a race mode in N plus, but honestly, it was a bit of an afterthought. We didn't have a lot of time testing it, and we especially didn't have a lot of time. De we didn't design the rules very well. Uh, with this one, really what we wanted to do is make it still this fun sort of party game experience if that's what you wanted. But also, if you really want to get into it, it supports sort of a deeper, more seriously competitive thing. So we're hoping to take it to Evo next year uh, because, I mean, since the core of the game is skill-based and the, the nature of the rules like, we, we spent a long time figuring out exactly the right rules that let the better player win, generally, but still enable people to come from behind uh, so that there's a bit of drama. Because there's nothing worse than, like, a racing game where if you lose the first level or two, you just know there's no way you're coming in first. So this one, especially with the player-controlled rockets, it's amazing because uh, it, it essentially robs, it denies your opponent whatever score they were going to get. It gives them zero for that level. So it, it can it could be a huge game changer if you master it. But it, the rockets are actually harder to control than the ninja. Um, all right, so that's about it. That's, that's race mode. Um, OK. Um, so I think we can yeah. move on to levels and editing now. Because the other, I mean, we just wrote a really long really long uh, blog post on the PlayStation blog about this. So we're going to keep this section short. But about, I think the main thing about M++ is that the levels are incredibly important. Because the gameplay feels great, and that's awesome. But you need to be able to showcase that gameplay and you know let people really feel how, how good it feels to run around these levels. And so you need, you need to really think about designing levels that support a number of different ways to play the game and a number of different types of players. And you have to think about who's playing and why. Like, are they just starting out? Great, there's some levels for those people. There are people playing in a party, levels for them. Really experienced high scorers, we've got levels for you too. So, but you have to think about who's playing and why and what do they want to do. And when we're building levels, as you can see in this frame by frame um, video, we, you think about the space. You put down some tiles, you put down some enemies, you think about how is the player going to move through this? Where are they going? And how can we make their journey incredibly difficult and hopefully kill them on the way? So we've spent the past two years making about 1,000 levels for N++. 
But we've generally been making levels for 10 years. So we've learned a ton over those 10 years. And we think that these in N++ are some of the best that we've ever made, which is really exciting. We didn't think that we could come up with any new ideas for level design. We thought, you know, we'd, we'd done it all, I guess. But surprisingly, no, we've, we have come up with some good stuff. Yeah, several times during development, we would sort of hit a wall where mm -hmm. it just felt like, this is it. Yeah, we have no more level ideas. And it would be sort of like a tough few days. And then mm -hmm. inevitably, we would actually come up with like an entirely new idea of how to use an enemy or how, like a new kind of uh, arrangement of tiles that lets you do something that we hadn't actually thought of before. And uh, that was like a, it was a really rewarding experience because we felt like we were really pushing ourselves because we don't want to repeat ourselves, um, but we did want to make sort of explore the design space of like the possibility space of what you could do with the levels as much as we could. And uh, yeah, I don't know, we're really excited with how it turned out. Yeah. Um, all right, so and I guess the last thing to talk about uh, related to levels is that there's going to be a built-in level editor with global level sharing, um, which is something we're really excited about. Because because this is the last and best version of the game, it's something we thought was very important to do right and to have in there. Because we think that, I mean, we're not making another one. But hopefully this way, the community, uh, the map making community, will sort of let the game live on without us. And uh, also, especially for the uh, race mode, for the competitive mode, we're really excited to see what the community does in terms of like coming up with tournament maps or like official maps yeah. for uh, tournaments and stuff. Because there are a lot, like the race mode, we haven't, we've only been making race levels for about six months. So we're still not entirely sure what all the different ideas are. Like this is, this is a race level right here. And so like we've, we've, you know, discovered like, oh, shortcuts. Shortcuts are fun. That doesn't usually come up in the, the main game, but shortcuts are like a, a huge fun thing in race mode. Mm -hmm. And just all, especially, you know, just like alternate alternate ways of moving through the space, alternate solutions uh, is really fun. Um, and uh, one final thing about the level editor and the global level sharing is that uh, we're running the servers and there's gonna be high scores, leaderboards for every level made by every player. And in, like part of the leaderboards will be replays. So every every victory by every player on every level is going to be there, and you can watch them all and sort of maybe cheat and <laughs> and uh, copy their run. Uh, all right. Uh, so one last thing, I'll just let this video play out, uh, is uh, the weekly challenge, which we're really excited about. So one problem with this high score replay thing, it's really cool, it's fun to watch people play and see what they do, and maybe try to improve their run a bit. But the thing that's always sort of depressed us is that after a while, everyone just sort of starts copying whoever has the best score. And we don't think that's very fun. So uh, in N++, there will be a feature called the weekly challenge, where every week there's a new map that we make, and you have one attempt at that map, one life. That's it. If you die, it's over. And I mean, they won't, they'll tend to be not as hard as the normal maps because of that. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but the, the most important thing about the weekly challenge is that we'll show you the leaderboard scores, but we're not going to show you the replays until the end of the week when we lock the leaderboard. So you have one week to try to figure out the best, I mean, you have one chance really, but basically you can't copy. You can't copy the other people. It's all about your skill at both playing the game and figuring out the solutions to the levels. So we're really excited to see um, what people come up with for that. Yeah. So that's about it. Um, we're just going to do some Q&A now. If you want to go to the microphone, if you have any questions, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, <coughs> I don't know if it's working or not. I'm live. Um, I know you guys keep pushing that this is the final, and that's it. Yeah. Why is that? Why are you guys calling it? Uh, uh, oh wait, let's just repeat the question. So, it's, okay. uh, right. so why are why are we calling it quits? I mean, honestly, there are a lot of reasons. One of them is that we uh, we're reaching the point of diminishing returns with the level making. We've made, as far as we can tell, on average one level per day for the last decade. <laughs> so we're kind of out of level ideas. Like we've really pushed ourselves, and we're we're pretty proud of what we've achieved. But we don't think we could do it again. I mean. If we did try to do it again, we might go crazy or yeah. it wouldn't be pretty. We don't want to take that chance. And I mean, the other big thing is just, I mean, the main thing is we, this is what we wanted to do. Like this, 
N++ is exactly what we wanted. We don't think we can improve it. And we try to make sure that like, it's all in this game. So, uh, so I, like, there's really no point in revis revisiting it. Also, we have lots of other game ideas. We kind of want to move on to some of them. But we felt like we couldn't do that until we did this game right. Like, in 2004, we had an idea for this game. But like we said earlier, we couldn't quite get there. Like, there were still things that we couldn't do. And it was because we didn't have enough experience or time or money or whatever. But we finally have done them. So we feel like we can, we can finally move on. You know, like, Mission accomplished. Yeah. yeah. I wish we had a nice banner that said yeah, that. Not sarcastically, though. We actually accomplished the mission. So yeah. I guess that, doesn't, that concept has been ruined. It's still good. What's next? Good question. Uh, we have a few sort of in development prototype games. Uh, we certainly, there are some sports, like arcade style sports games uh, that we want. I mean, because like I've actually, I still play NHL 2001 with one of my friends, uh, which I think it's the best one because it's sort of, it's the perfect marriage of the old sort of Genesis Super Nintendo ones with, it's like, it's got a, a bit more depth, not too much. And also, the hitting is so much better. Like, I don't know what they did with the recent ones, where it's like you hit someone and they just kind of, they don't do anything. But in 2001, when you hit someone, they go flying. And it's just so, it's like the way that we play is, it's almost more like football, where there's just waves of people smashing into each other, and then someone emerges with the puck. But, oh, sorry, I'm, this is way too much of a tangent. But anyways, so like, I don't know, we have like a grappling physics uh, platformer. We have Office Yeti, which is sort of like uh, HR inadvertently hires a Yeti, and... So no one knows you're a Yeti because, you know, in an office, you're so apathetic. Yeah, you so you don't really know, you know, you, yeah. like we, uh, before we made N, I mean, when we were making N, we worked sort of crappy office jobs. So we, it was, it's inspired from ideas at that time, which essentially it's like a pretext for setting up scenarios where you can like throw your boss out the window or push him downstairs or something. But yeah. the, the idea is that you, you're in an office and you're a Yeti, but as long as you don't do anything crazy like punch a hole through the wall or eat someone, no one will notice because you're wearing a tie so you, you kind of fit in. And it's, it's sort of like a puzzle action game. I don't know. There, there are a few more. But, like, I mean, really... Well, we've got, like, a huge text file full yeah, of Yeah, we have, like, a 10,000-line text file of stuff to so, prototype, yeah. which we're really excited to get to as soon as this thing is done. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Uh, oh, no, just NHL 2001. I... Was it the three-on-three three one? Yeah, it wasn't quite. I don't know. I like I like a bit less arcade. That was like that was like a, I remember it's sort of like an NBA Jam style. Yeah, I mean it was it's totally fun, but like I don't know. But yeah, it's. I mean I forget there was a hockey an indie hockey game announced in the past year, but I I think it's kind of fallen by the wayside. But it looked amazing when you hit someone, they ragdoll and they fly through the glass, and it's just like we were kind of pissed, me and my friend. When we saw it, because we were like, that's what we want to do that. Oh, There's well. There's probably still room. Yeah. Um, oh, he's the artist. He's one of the artists that worked on Sound Shapes. I don't know. Incidentally, just in case. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes. yes. I mean. Hopefully, Sean is going to write. Sean. McGrath is our programmer. He made Dyad for PSN. Hopefully, he's going to do a, a giant article or a paper or something explaining this in detail. But I think we can give you a quick. Yeah, uh, we generally understand. I mean, we don't actually understand exactly how we implement it, and he's changed it three or four times to optimize it. So it's actually not as much of a hog now as it was. Um, but it's all uh, sign distance fields. That's like all the geometry is described by geometry, by uh, line segments and arcs. And so, and every color is composited separately. Uh, so like the basic idea is in the shader, you calculate for each pixel the distance to the geometry. And then there's a threshold where we uh, smooth step between opaque and transparent. That gives you the nice edge. Uh, but what makes it so slow is just to composite it properly, we're using like 12 full screen buffers. So we're using just a ton of fill rate. Uh, and, and the pixel shader is not super light either because it's doing a lot of distance calculations in it. But lots of verts too, right? Oh yeah, and there's like, I think there's like one to two million verts per frame somehow. I mean, you can't tell, but it's just like the, everything is quads that 
cover the geometry and then it runs the, sh like it's all in shaders really, but it's, I don't know, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with Dyad, you know that Sean is like a crazy graphics guy and that's sort of one of the main reasons why we wanted to work with him, other than he hates every game but he likes N and he's, he's a friend of ours from Toronto uh, and he cares just as much as we do about like little things like menus that are really smooth and responsive and stuff. So, but yeah, so we were like, okay, good. We have this crazy wizard graphics programmer. We can finally do proper anti-aliasing. Uh, and we, we hope that more games do it this way because uh, it just, it feels so smooth and it's really fun and exciting. But when we started, we were like, why doesn't anyone do it this way? Everyone's so stupid. But after two years, we know why they don't do it. It's like so much work. It's so, <laughs> all the animations, we mock up and then Sean has to actually program, like it's all, it's all in code. So it's, I don't know, it's pretty, oh, uh, we should have mentioned earlier that yeah, there's a third member of the team that isn't here, but. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we, we did the sound for the original uh, N, but we're not doing the sound for this one. Uh, I forget his company name, but I, Michael, Michael Surix from LA is doing the sand in this one. Um, and I mean, the well, process... There's oh, one sound that carries over from Oh, yeah, we made the gold sound, and we keep that the same. I mean, it, it gets a bit, like, EQ differently and stuff, but... You can't even tell. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, it's pretty minimal. We try to keep it functional, so basically, anytime there's an event where anything in the game changes state, we want to indicate that through the sound. That way, if you're not even, if you're not looking directly, you're still aware that something has happened. And I think the biggest, our biggest mandate is wet, meaty thwacking for the ragdoll sounds. And some bone crunching. And bone crunching. Really good the ragdoll crunching. sounds are so important. Yep. Uh, and that's certainly, that's the thing that we had did the most iteration on uh, with our sound guy, is getting the ragdoll to sound really nice and juicy when it thwacks into things. Yep. Um, any more questions? When's it coming out? Uh, when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> but it should be done early next year. I mean, it, it was supposed to be a launch title, so we're obviously we've slipped a bit. I think the thing is like, well, it's true. We just want to make sure that this, since this is the last one ever, that it's the best. And it's got to be perfect, but I mean, we're almost there. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna be, we should be done in the next couple months, and then there's QA and localization and stuff, so we don't exactly know how long it's gonna take, but it, it'll be early, early next year for sure. PS4 for sure. We don't know about Vita. I mean, because again, like the graphics. Yeah, with super we, complicated. we shot ourselves in the foot with the graphics, really. But I mean, we don't really care because we just love how it looks. But, but Sean's uh, optimizing. You never know. Yeah, I mean, it. A year ago, we asked Sean, "So can we do a Vita version?" He was like, "Never. We'll n it will never be possible." Like, but now he's like, "Oh, actually." Maybe, maybe we can do it. And we, uh, the thing is, we've always wanted it to be on Vita yes. because we love the Vita and the screen especially. It, it's going to look so nice with the vectors. Uh, so we made sure when we designed all of the UI and everything that it is compatible with the smaller screen. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's definitely within the realm of possibility, but we don't want to say for sure because we don't know yet. But as soon as we know, we will be announcing, I'm, I'm sure. Any other questions? Oh, the love letter. Oh, well, the, the game itself is programmed from scratch in C++. Sean wrote the engine. Um, the level editor is something we spent a lot of time on. Uh, there was an editor in N+, but it was kind of clunky. I mean, it, it did the job, and a lot of people made levels and had fun with it, and it was fun to use, but we felt like it was a bit of a barrier. It was so slow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it was like, it's hard to describe. So basically, we spent a lot of time redesigning it. So there's actually, there's one editor, but there's two control schemes. There's sort of the party mode control scheme, which uses the gamepad, and up to four people can be editing the level at the same time. And um, it's just sort of, it's like an improved version of what we had in N+, where you can pull up a palette of different objects and then just sort of place them around. And then it supports a bit more advanced stuff, like you can select a region and rotate it and copy and paste and some, some more advanced stuff like that. Uh, but the the expert editor. We, we tried to make sure that the gamepad editor was fun and something that you could immediately start making levels. Like it takes about a minute to figure out how to make a level. Uh, but for the advanced people, 
they, you get to use the editor that we use, which is if you plug a mouse and keyboard in, a uh, USB mouse and keyboard, uh, you can then use the expert mode editor, which is not easy to, it, we use literally every key on the keyboard, uh, but if once you learn it, you get really fast. Like, I mean, these days it takes us like 30 to 40 minutes to make a level because all of the low hanging fruit is gone, so we really have to push to find some, like a new idea, but like, we used to be able to make a pretty good level in like 10 to 15 minutes, but again, it's, that's after like a few years of learning all of the keys, because there's, it's so many hotkeys. Yeah. Um, oh, but you can't, there, I don't think there will be a standalone version. It'll be built right into N++, so you can make lots of levels when that comes out, but until then, I'm afraid you're gonna have to wait. Any other questions? Yep. Um, tough question. I mean, when we when we started our company, I remember telling my parents, and the look of like fear on their faces was, uh, well, it it scared me too, I guess. But I mean, that was when did we start Meta in two thousand and one, really? So we were kind of arrogant and ballsy, and we didn't really think it was going to be a problem ever. Um, and then we released our first game, and for free which again, met with incredible fear from my parents because it's a terrible business decision. But we felt like as a long-term thing, it might actually be good because everyone will play a free game, but it's hard to get people to play something that they have to pay for. So we kind of thought, hopefully this will get people to try it and see what's good about it because I mean, the screenshots maybe, it's just a sea of gray. So hopefully, you know, at least getting them to try it would help. But I mean, the thing is, we didn't really have a very good plan. We were doing contract work. We were just kind of trying to get by and make something that we really wanted to make. Um, did you want to go? Oh, uh, yeah. So I think one thing is we're lucky. We're in Toronto, and there are a lot of uh, other developers there. And so pretty much everyone we know is into games. So it doesn't come up a lot. Um, I don't know. Like I kind of feel sad for people that don't like games. Because, uh, I mean, I think that there's, an, there's something there for everyone. And they're so diverse, especially in these days, that, uh, I mean, honestly, I remember actually a, a few GDCs ago, we were in a cab, and the cabbie, he was crazy. He was talking, like, he was just, this, he was like, oh, I hate bikers. I want to, like, run down people who drive bikes. And so we asked him if he played games. He's like, oh, no, I don't even play cards. I'm, a, I'm against games. And we were like, you know there's a game called Crazy Taxi? where literally what you do is you run over people for fun. And he's like, what? And it like blew his mind. So I think like a lot of times, a lot of times when someone is like, you know, they don't like games, they maybe just haven't been exposed to something that is to their taste. Um, I mean, they're always like really uh, narrow-minded people that no matter what you say, they're not gonna like it. But I just, I think like staying positive and trying to understand where the negativity is coming from is a good way of dealing with it. But I don't know. What about games that you can play? Um, well, I think, yeah, we, I'm sure every game gets a ton of criticism because it's very subjective. You know, our likes and dislikes are all particular to who we are. So I think the way we've chosen to look at it is if we're happy, that's a big part of how we feel about this game in general. And we can kind of let a lot of criticism bounce off of us because, I mean, it still stings, absolutely. But, I mean, if we know that this is what we wanted to do and that we're proud of it or that we're really solidly happy with it, then it definitely helps. It doesn't, it doesn't obliterate the criticism and we, you know, of course we, we hear all of it and it does, it does hurt. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you're doing what you love and this is, what you really believe in, then that's the best you can do. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly like we 
this is sort of our lives, so it definitely can hurt. But at the same time, yeah, like, our- There's a lot of good stuff, too. I mean, yeah. it helps to show the game at places like this because you get a lot of people who really can see what you're doing and love it. Like, you can, when, even when people are dying over and over and over, but they're still smiling and laughing, it, it makes me feel like, okay, you know, maybe it's okay. These people are clearly enjoying it. I guess I've, we've done a pretty good job. So even if someone says it's the worst game ever and it's, you know, it should never have been made, which happens, you know, at least we can feel like, well, but that guy liked it. Yeah, like I think we're we're aware that it's a very niche thing. Oh, yeah. uh, so we don't expect everyone, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, but yeah, but we really feel like as long as we're happy with it at the end of the day, like that's that's the best we can do. We Like as long as we know we've, done our the best job that we can i mean yeah and there's that's it really i mean we'll, we'll it's gonna hurt but we will still feel good about the game i think I and to know. be completely selfish like the reason that we make games that the games that we make is because we're really making them for us these are the games that we want to play like this is the game that i've been wanting to actually play for 10 years so it kind of doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks all right any last questions What are we playing? Lots of stuff. Uh, um, Doom the Roguelike is probably the game I've spent the most hours playing other than original Doom. And Spelunky. Uh, and Spelunky, actually, yeah. Spelunky is, is probably, it's Spelunky and Doom the Roguelike for sure. But what, if, like, recently, Geometry Wars 3. Yeah. Uh, um, Fantasy Life. Fantasy Life. Uh, God. So many. Why can't we actually we any? have been working a lot, so we haven't been playing very many games. I mean, we just got Grand Theft Auto V. We haven't had a chance to try it yet. Yep, it just arrived on the day that we left. Um, but, I mean, mostly indie games are really... I mean, Spelunky is just like... I don't understand why more people aren't making games like Spelunky, other than it's very hard. But uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. That's actually... They're, they're from Toronto, too. Uh, no. That's very wrong. That's, I, I, we don't have, we only have 12 minutes, so I can't get into why, but agree to disagree. Uh, but I mean, what other games? I, don't know why I mean, oh, Dark Souls, really like, I mean, I didn't, I'm not super, Dark Souls 2 is, I'll, uh, maybe I need to start again or something, but I haven't been liking Dark Souls 2 that much because it, it just feels like it's hallways. It's all, it, like, the amazing thing about Dark Souls, I mean, I haven't actually beaten Dark Souls. I beat Demon Souls, but I have not had time to beat Dark Souls yet. I've, but, like, the, the verticality of it and the way that the space wraps around in itself is just, like, I don't understand, like, again, it's like, now that they've done that, why doesn't, why don't more games, it's like, that is clearly a much more interesting model of creating a world than just a bunch of levels or, like, a flat city or something like that. Um, what else? What else is good? We're pretty picky. I don't know. Uh, hmm. Actually, Drum Tour Wars 2, I still play a lot of. Uh, especially pacifism. I can't get enough of pacifism. It's the best. Um, was there another question? I thought I saw. Uh, well, I guess the Leafs. We're from Toronto. We're Leafs fans, but it's but, tough to be a Leafs fan yeah, we, because they suck. We don't really, like, I don't think we've watched a game this season because I don't know if anyone we caught. Tried. We tried half a game. And yeah? It, yeah, we, it's, it was it's, terrible. It's just, there's this feeling of disgust you get when, I don't know if anyone saw them in the playoffs last year, but it's like they were up by, like, three goals. And that's, like, the classic. They do that literally all the time. And so that was the time we were, like, fuck. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, we were, like, basically, screw these people. They're dead to us now. But... Anything else? All right. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Today's thanks so much.